Greetings, Twitch tubes. And the 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 link Twitters. Everyone, welcome. Happy to have you here. Happy Thursday. Uh, intro to Tetra. Y'all have no idea what the uh, you know the topic is because my face is in the way. Of course, it's it's not actually my face, but let me move that out of the way. Yeah, part one of seven thousand ninety one. So this is the second part in the series. Um, and we're going to be going a little bit over blockchain peer-to-peer -peer networking. So part zero was just kind of a general overview of Tetra. Uh, some of the reasons why we're doing Tetra, some of the explanation behind the name Tetra, which I completely got wrong, by the way. Uh, well, it was, I mean, it was close. Tetra is a, it's a, it's a hypercube thing of a Bob. Go, go look that one up if you want to, uh, an explanation for the name. Um, anyway, it's it's like our, our third major release of our blockchain protocol. It's still in development. Uh, we're working on it. We're working real real hard. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun along the way, and we have implemented some really cool things uh, and some really awesome technology. Uh, among the cool things is peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking. And it's super important in blockchains. So I guess let's find out why. The motivation, because sharing is mutually beneficial. Okay, so blockchain nodes are, they're responsible for making new blocks and then validating other people's blocks. That's like their two main jobs, like the, the, the two main jobs of a blockchain node. Once you have like blocks, you need to go and share those with other nodes in the network. Okay, and sharing of information, like blocks, that benefits everyone. There's this little, little, I don't know, motto, blocks make new blocks. And that's, it's especially true in Tacticos. Anyway, a blockchain node, if it's just kind of rolling on its own, it doesn't really do much good. That's essentially just a centralized database that's really inefficient. And you could use different technology. The whole point of a blockchain is to decentralize the decision-making process, essentially. And you decentralize it across a distributed set of nodes. And by node, I mean, like, basically just a computer that's running a program that executes the protocol correctly. Okay, so this protocol is responsible for making blocks and is responsible for validating blocks. And it's also responsible for diffusing information across a large network of other blockchain nodes. Now, sharing of information benefits everyone in Tacticos, as I mentioned. Okay, because if you try to just produce blocks on your own in isolation, then you're just going to basically build a slower blockchain, like less of a blockchain. It's going to be smaller. It's not going to be as good as other chains. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm going with because sharing is mutually beneficial. Okay, you get benefit from sharing blocks with other participants so that they can go and build off of your block and then they can share their new block with you. Your two powers combined are going to build a better blockchain than if either of you tried to do so independently in isolation. You're going to make a longer blockchain. You're, you'll be able to include more transactions. And you'll be able to serve your users in a much more usable fashion. Okay, so there is benefit to sharing information with other peers in your network. Just a little note here. So Ethereum's realization of this is the data availability problem. And so the, the data availability problem is basically like you have an arbitrary key. How do you go get the data? It needs to be available somewhere. Alrighty. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, it's the motivation. It's because sharing is mutually beneficial in blockchains. 
So what's the inspiration? Because sharing is mutually beneficial. Okay, so we take a lot of our inspiration from the really, really smart folks at IOHK uh, who've come up with this consensus mechanism called Ouroboros. And Ouroboros, it's a family, well, yeah, so proof of stake consensus protocol. Uh, Ouroboros is one of a few, but it's, it's I mean, arguably the best. We're, we're going to prove that. You'll see. You'll see. Cardano is actively proving it. Um, yeah, so th they're really smart. They know what they're doing. Um, and like we, we like a lot of the work that they do. They have awesome ideas. Uh, we have awesome ideas as well that we've incorporated into their awesome ideas to build a super awesome idea. Okay, so again, just like in blockchains, sharing information, particularly like technologies, is really beneficial because we can all build upon each other's technologies and build a much better technology than if we were to just build in isolation. So look at that. I got to copy paste a sub headline and it worked out. Anyway, in this particular case, uh, the Ouroboros network uh, gives us these two main things that we incorporated in our peer to peer networking mechanism. First thing is this concept of typed protocols. Okay, and a typed protocol is a two party, single agency state machine. I'll get to what all those words mean in a few slides, so just bear with me. Just know that they came up with a really awesome state machine mechanism that works really well over uh, a network. Okay, and then the second thing is multiplexing. Okay, so multiplexing basically means encoding multiple different protocols through a single communication channel. Okay, so the, the point above this, typed protocols, well, that's plural. There are many typed protocols, and you want to run all of them over a single wire. That's for optimization reasons. You don't want to go and bind a gazillion ports on your host machine because you may not be able to, depending on your environment, blah, 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 blah. You get to run it all over a single wire and it's it's you don't have to pay the penalty quite as bad. Anyway, there's a, a couple links right there if, if you're interested, but we're going to go and look at those in a little bit anyway, so stay tuned. Uh, but yeah, so... We, we gathered a lot of our inspiration from how Cardano implements their network uh, for Orboros. So that's some of the inspiration behind uh, our networking layer. Next up, we have considerations. Okay, so blockchains are database. Well, okay, I'll give you a second to finish counting. Okay, good, six. All right, so blockchains are databases. And in particular, they're, they're databases with a lot of persistent data. Okay, so for example, our, our test net, I think the compressed data size is four gigabytes right now, which is about uh, 37 whirly flops if, if you're a fan of metric. Um, I sometimes get the conversion mixed up, but it's, it's something like that. It's a lot of data though. Um, and you need to be able to well, add to that data with new transactions, but also you know read certain data and use that data for validation purposes. Um, but anyway, it, it, at the end of the day, it is like a super database that is decentralized across a bunch of different peers. Now to the next point though, blockchain nodes are also exposed to the public. Those two things really don't go together very well. It, like, I feel like, <laughs> The only example, other example I can think of that does this is like Firebase from from Google, the Google Cloud Platform, where it's like basically a public database, but blockchains are an entirely different way of doing it. Um, but yeah, it's like it's a it's a publicly readable database. Everything is open to the public, um, and it's like it's kind of publicly writable as long as you can prove that you are authorized to move the funds or tokens or whatever. Uh, that's part of the extended UTXO system. Uh, there's you can uh, watch watch the previous video in the series for a bit more about that. Uh, anyway, there's a there's a lot of data, and that data needs to be made public. Um, and you know, just going back to the initial point, like sharing is mutually beneficial. So you need to be public with your node, publicly facing, so that you can share information with others. 
You need to go outside if you want to make friends. Apparently. It's ridiculous, though. Okay, next point, though. Verify. There, there's like, so there's no trust. There's no trust but verify that gets said a lot in the blockchain space. But that's that's not a thing. Blockchains are all about trusting nobody. It's just, I, I love it. It's perfect. Okay, so any piece of information that you hear about from one of your peers in the network, you go and check it. And I mean, sometimes you double check it. You want to make sure that they're not lying to you about the data that they give you. You got to go and verify every little thing. It does mean that it's slower, but it also means that it's a lot more secure, which comes in handy in, in blockchains. Okay, and then like final consideration that I could come up with and then also fit on the slide in, in this number of bullet points. Uh, network speeds vary widely. Okay, so if I were to go and do a speed test, well, I'm, I'm running over Wi-Fi, so it's, it's probably like 20, 30 megabits per second down. I don't know, somewhere in that ballpark. And that's just like connecting to whatever speed test server it is. And that's that's a good internet connection, relatively speaking. Like super, well, a super good internet connection would be something like a cloud hosting internet provider. So you can go and host like everything on Google Cloud or AWS or Azure or DigitalOcean or whatever. And that is that is great, at least initially, because they're super fast and you don't have to worry about network speeds there. But that is also sort of counterproductive for blockchains, especially in the notion of decentralization and distribution of your computing resources. If you, if you put all of your blockchain nodes all in one cloud hosting provider, well, that cloud hosting provider now technically owns your network because they own the data and like the secret keys running on all your nodes and, and all that fun stuff. So you've just centralized your blockchain network under the umbrella of whatever cloud hosting provider. You can make it a little bit better and go with multiple cloud hosting providers, but then you're still under you know the jurisdiction of particular governments, for example. So at the end of the day, you really need to plan for distributing all of your blockchain nodes on well, everywhere across the planet with potentially not so great internet connections, especially if you need to send messages, you know, all, all the way across the globe. So like if I, you know, if I meant a new block and I want to go and yeet that sucker all the way to Australia, well, it's going to take a little while. There's, there's, there's a couple lakes in the way, I think. I don't know. I don't go to the, the that, that, that big body of water very often. There's. There's a lot of water. Um, it, it's going to take a while, though. And it's got to compete with some other traffic. And so all of that fun stuff. Uh, because of that, you need to plan for basically your slowest connection, uh, especially when you're developing your consensus mechani mechanism. Luckily, our research team was able to encode that into Tacticos. And that's you know part of our consensus mechanism. Um, it makes it a first class thing within our blockchain. If you want to learn more about Tacticos, just you know, research, reach out to Aaron or Hans from our research team. They'd be you know happy to, to explain all that kinds of fun stuff. Um, okay, so yeah, you really need to plan around having slow internet connections, uh, even if you do have the luxury of fast internet connections in some cases. Um, Okay. Yeah. So just a, there's a comment in the chat here about so encryption. Okay. So if you're yeah if you're going with like a cloud hosting provider, uh, like th they they do have mechanisms to allow you to like not grant them access to your keys. Um. So they like they they can give you some some leeway there, but if if you're still not comfortable with that, then yeah, to this point, uh, you can you can manage keys yourself. Um, and that that gives you more security in a cloud hosted environment. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's just, you know, some considerations that we kind of had to think through when going through a networking design for, for a blockchain. Uh, okay. So next up. Actually, before I go on to this, it's, uh, See if there are any any other questions that may come up in the chat while I throw on some 
some awesome rock music here and take a sip of water. Okay, water breaks over. All righty. Let's go to a story. Usually, I leave the storytelling to Hans. Well, I'm going to take this one. Hans, I think you're going to be really impressed. This is a, this is a fantastic story here. Let me, uh, let me full screen for this. Pier 4B55 says to Pier FD97, I made a block. FD97 responds, send it to me. Here you go. Maybe say please next time. Maybe try not to be so passive aggressive all the time. I just expect a little bit of politeness is all. Retorts 4B55. Politeness? We're computers. This isn't even a real conversation. Responds 97. Okay, but maybe you could try just, just a little. This is 55. Why should I bother trying? This whole short story is a disaster. It's not funny. And it's going to fall completely flat with a live broadcast audience. Says 97. Good point. By the way, I made another block. Send it to me. Excuse me? Send it to me, please? Also, I really wish you would stop wasting all of this network bandwidth. Our time should be spent exchanging transactions as quickly as possible, but instead you insist on pleasantries like please and thank you. We don't have time for all of that. We have important work to do here, and you're really starting to drag this network down, says 97. Tragically, 4B55 had to terminate the connection due to a protocol violation error. 97 didn't have agency to send that second message. Very unfortunate. The end. Okay, so that's all we have time for today, folks. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all learned something today. Um, oh, wait. No, got a couple more slides, actually. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, what's up next? Oh, yeah, multiplexing. Yeah, I guess we got to actually talk about the subject here. Fine. Okay. So what is multiplexing? Well, as I mentioned, it's running a few different notification protocols over a single communication channel. So you can see here up at the top, we've got two communication channels, communication channel A, communication channel B. And they both want to operate over the same wire, uh, which means that you need to stitch those two things together into a single stream of information A, B, A, B. Well, I guess, you know, you'd be reading the other direction because I guess B happened first. Anyway, you're combining two different channels of information over a single connection. And you can, not just two, you could do this with any number. Any number greater than zero. Actually, hmm. now that I think about it, you could actually have a multiplex connection with like zero zero communication it would just be silence oh it's the perfect conversation uh, I'm, I'm gonna make note to uh to add that to the protocol um okay anyway so that's multiplexing you're uh you're combining two streams putting them into one stream demultiplexing is the opposite so you got a, a stream of mixed up data from the remote peer and it's coming into you and you need to untangle it and decide what to do with all the little pieces that get stitched together. Okay, so you're unstitching this 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 A B A B like all muddled together into like things that are 
belonging to protocol A and then things that are belonging to protocol B. It's not like super complicated of a topic, but it like when you combine it with the type protocols that I'm about to talk about, it comes in, you know, really handy. Okay, so typed protocols, as I mentioned, they're finite state machines. This should be, I guess, yeah, whatever. It's a finite state machine. There's a known set of states and a known set of state transitions. Okay, so the, the machine is in one state and then it can move to another state and then to another state. That's you know, how, how a state machine works. This one's a little bit different because there are two different participants in it, so two parties. And we could theoretically expand it to just like any number of parties. Uh, but anyway, like they're both participating in the same state machine. And the state transitions are invoked through the exchanging of messages. And those messages are sent over the wire. Okay, so even though they're both participating in this type protocol, there's this thing called single agency which means that only one party is allowed to send the next message for any given state within that particular typed protocol. Okay, so some more illustration here. This time it's it's not a story. It's just stepping through it. Okay, so we got two participants, two parties here. We have peer A and peer B. Uh, they're both in the initial state in it, uh, but you can see that th they both have a green circle, green highlighting on that, that circle in the middle on that state. And that means that peer A, the, the green peer, is expected to send the next message, or rather the first message. Okay, so peer A sends the start message over to peer B. Because peer A sent it, peer A can switch to the next state, it's a known state transition into the ready state to receive, you know, a message. Um, you can see that the ready circle is now purple, and that means that it's expecting a message from peer B to be sent next. However, peer A just sent the message, and it's still going over the wire. It takes a second. So peer B is still technically in the initial state until it receives that start message. But eventually it does receives the message, and now they're both in the same state, the same ready state. But peer B is now ready for some actual data. So it goes and requests some information from peer A with a message, get, and you know they pass in maybe an ID or a key, whatever, for the data. So peer B sends that get message, and then it knows it needs to go into the wait transition again. And again, wait is, it's, it's a green circle, which means peer B is now expecting a message from peer A. But while, it's, while that message is still over the wire, peer A is in the ready state and is still waiting for that message. Eventually, peer A receives the message, and now they're both in the wait state again. Well, peer A needs to give a response to peer B because peer B wanted some data. So peer A sends a response with the actual data. And then switches back into the ready state, where it's expecting a message from peer B again. And then finally, peer B receives the message, the response, and they're both in the ready state again, until peer B needs some more information. Then it sends another get message. But I didn't really feel like continuing that process. We already saw what happens. You, you go from this state, and then you just keep, repeat the process I didn't show the exit condition. There is like a done message that could be sent, but you know, for, for now, it's just the, the protocol doesn't terminate. Uh, so yeah, it's like the end of the this particular type protocol. It's just a simple get and then response type protocol. Now, combining the two things together, the things in the middle are the type protocols, and then the blue circles connected to the computers are the multiplexers. And we were just looking at one side of what's called a request response protocol. We'll get to that in a second. All of those are reciprocated though. So you can see like the, the top one up at the top. Uh, well, uh, sorry, um, 
there's another protocol. I wish I could highlight on on this thing. Um, look at the like the the second chunk of uh, you know communications there for the get block protocol. Okay, so the peer on the right is sending block IDs over to the peer on the left, and then the peer on the left responds with blocks. And then there's the other similar uh, like reciprocated version of that uh, all the way at the bottom. Again, a block get block protocol where the peer on the left sends block IDs to, to the peer on the right, and then the peer on the right responds with blocks. In other words, one of them acts as the server, one of them acts as, as the response, and there are two in any particular multiplexed connection. So again, one side acts as the server in, in one of those instances, and then uh, it acts as the client in the other instance. OK, so the other you know, protocol in there is the block notification protocol. I'll talk about that in a second. But you, you'll see that it's, it's just block IDs going one way, and there are no responses. So it's just notifications. It's just a, essentially unidirectional. Okay, but all of these protocols run over a single wire, a single connection. And that single connection, it, 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 it allows blocks to share information with other nodes um, and you know, get their, their chains in, in sync, essentially. Okay, uh, so we've got a question here. Which peers talk to which peers? Uh, so this is something that I think it falls under what we're calling peer management. We're st we still need to evolve this in the like the Tetra protocol, uh, but growing that like set of peers with which you can communicate is something that we'll be implementing. Uh, on like the Cardano side, they have like cold, warm, and hot peers, which distinguish like uh, I guess like the 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 role that the peer plays within that local node's you know perspective of the network. Uh, so different roles for different peers, and depending on the role, there's you know different uh, type protocols that need to be run. Uh, so as far as like which peers talk to which peers, well, right now it's just a, a hard coded. You specify an IP address and a port uh, to initiate a connection to a remote peer, and once that connection's uh, initiated, uh, the two nodes can start to talk and exchange data. Okay. Uh, so I think, yeah, this is, I think is the, the final slide that I have, and then I'll, I'll go over to some web browser stuff and then do some code stuff, just like last time. Uh, anyway, we have a, oh, sorry, I did miss a, another question. So let me, let me see if I can address this one. Uh, do you organize protocols by peers, or does each peer maintain its own protocol instance? Uh, so like for every single peer to peer communication, so like, uh, peer A talking to peer B, uh, they're running the entire suite of protocols. So each peer to peer connection right now runs, I think 14 different type protocols on the te Tetra, uh, in the Tetra networking implementation. Um, and I, I don't know if that's directly uh, answering your question. Uh, I hope it does, but feel free to ask a follow-up if, if I didn't. Uh, and then we've got one more question. Oops, sorry, uh, to click this. Does the pattern of which peers talk to which peers influence the consensus outcome? Yeah, um, I think it, like, it definitely will. Um, so part of like how Ouroboros does this or yeah, like with, with that hot, warm, cold thing. So one of the responsibilities of the warm set of peers is simply uh, like understanding network bandwidth between those, like how fast that particular connection is allowed to go, like doing latency checks, doing speed checks, that kind of thing with the goal being to properly build the healthiest possible peer to peer network. Uh, that's that's most optimal for diffusing information uh, across the entire network, um, and so there there are like some considerations that need to go into that. You don't want to localize all of your connections, 
So for example, right now I'm located in like the Northeast of the United States. Well, the, the peers that I want to talk to, I don't want to just talk to people located in the Northeast of the United States. I want to talk to a few because I'll be able to talk to them the quickest, but I do also want to mix in, you know, a couple of people from Australia, you know, some people from Texas, some people from Europe, all over the globe. Um, and so you do want a mixture, uh, but that, that's stuff that we still need to explore uh, and how we're going to implement uh, in Tetra. Uh, and then so uh, another question, would random peer selection be better for consensus than fixed? Uh, I'd say like, yeah, that, that would definitely be better than just like a fixed set where like it's just configured for every single node to try to target a centralized node with a single IP address. That's probably how it's going to have to work just like for a little bit. But yeah, ideally you want to be able to to connect to essentially a random distribution of peers uh, instead of just, you know, hammering the same nodes with with peer to peer connection requests. Um, okay. And then see yeah, another comment. Um, so yeah, this is saying, uh, I think that this is a follow-up to does the pattern of which peers talk to which peers influence the consensus outcome? And then so the, uh, you know, response here, it can, but only in certain regimes, if block frequency is much less than propagation delay, then there shouldn't be an effect. Ideally, geography does not bias consensus. Um, and so, yeah, that, that second sentence right there, if block frequency is much less than propagation uh, delay, then uh, let's see, yeah, that, that's where we really need to uh, tune the parameters of Tacticos correctly so that it kind of accounts for that so that geography can't bias consensus in, in an adverse way. Okie dokie. Uh, so yeah, great questions. Thank you. Appreciate the engagement. Uh, and definitely feel free to uh, to, to leave any follow-up questions and we'll, we'll try to get to them. Okay, so the Tetra typed protocols, big house, small bricks. So again, the, the, the approach that we took here is to do really, really simple typed protocols and have many of them in such a way that we can compose them together to build really complex houses, really big houses. Uh, so yeah, this, this is what we have at the moment. And again, all of these get reciprocated. So for each one of these, there's uh, a, a duplicate. So there are seven uh, protocols listed, which means there are 14 instances of a type protocol over every peer-to-peer -peer multiplex connection. Okay, so the first one, slot data request response protocol. Uh, I don't want to get too much into what slot data means. It's basically just a really lightweight block header. And it's helpful for uh, well, a few different parts of consensus. But the, the main place that it's helpful for us is in the chain selection algorithm because it allows us to do chain selection without needing the full header. And then we just need to, again, we, we, we need to go and verify everything that they tell us, which means once we've done chain selection, we go and get the header and verify that the slot data was correct. So, you know, a few different things in there. Anyway, next one, block header request response protocol. So this is, again, just a simple, I have a block ID. I need the block header associated with that ID. So I'm going to go and ask for it from the remote peer. Next one is for block bodies. I've got a block ID and I need to go get the block body associated with that uh, particular block. And then this next one, transaction, uh, I have a transaction ID and I need to go and get the transaction associated with that ID. And I do just want to note here that there's like a, I think that I, I'm not really aware of other blockchains that do this, but we're taking a different approach in how we model a block body in Tetra. Usually in most other blockchains, a block body is a sequence of transactions, like the full transaction. And there could be like 10 of them in a block. Whereas in Tetra, what we're doing, a block body is a sequence of transaction IDs. Okay, and so you're still committing 
to all of the transactions within the block. But that block body contains, well, it's a lot lighter weight than a block body in a different kind of blockchain. And that comes in real handy for these little, you know, mini typed protocols where you may go and request a block body from a remote peer and you get the list of transaction IDs back and you realize, oh, wait, I already own half of these transactions in my local data storage. I don't need to go and fetch that half of them. I'm just going to go and fetch, you know, the, the transactions that I don't have yet. Okay, so we were, we're, we're hoping that that allows us to optimize our network communication so that two block bodies that contain roughly the same list of transactions, maybe with a couple slight differences, you don't need to ex exchange all of that transaction data multiple times. It's just a one-time thing, and then you get to reference it in different places. So that's, again, kind of why we went with these small bricks for the type protocols. It was because we got to do this little like these little atomic exchanges like that. And we don't need to exchange quite as much information with the peer. Okay, so those are like like raw storage request response protocols. Um, got a question in here that is uh, relevant. So I'll get to this right, right now. Uh, so how is it possible to do that decoupling? Um, okay, so a transaction contains a list of transaction inputs and a list of transaction outputs and then some metadata and some other scheduling information. You could take that transaction and turn it into a sequence of bytes. Like you can encode it into a sequence of bytes. And then you can take that sequence of bytes and you can hash it and you can turn it into ID in an ID, like a, a transaction ID. And that sequence of bytes, it maps exactly to that one ID. And anyone else who has a sequence of bytes can rerun that same hashing algorithm and result in that same ID for the transaction. So that tr like the transaction ID, although it doesn't contain the data of the transaction, it's still committing to all the data of the transaction. Um, so because of that, uh, like you don't need to include the full transaction within a block body in order to commit to it. You just need to really commit to the ID. Um, and you know, that, that that's the important part. The rest of it is just the actual data. And I mean, you can just go fetch that out like from a different source of information. As long as you can just verify locally that the ID that was claimed matches the data of the transaction, then everything is good and you're all happy. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I don't I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, again, feel free to you know, follow up with another question if if I didn't quite get to it. Um, okay, so uh, those are like the the like the flat storage ones. Next one is block ID at height request response protocol. It's a bit of a mouthful. And this is more of a utility type protocol, and it allows a a blockchain node to ask a remote peer, hey, what block ID do you have at height 3,752? And then the remote peer can say, I've got block XYZ, or block ID XYZ. Um, you know, here you go. So this comes in handy for a couple of reasons. First thing, you can use it to go and see what's the genesis block on the remote peer. So what's the block at height equals one so that you know as long like every single node that's on the same network should all at least agree on that one particular block at the very least may not agree on the second block again that's where chain selection comes into play you need to go and figure that one out but it at least allows you to figure out are we on the same network and do we agree on the same first block of our blockchain so that's the first use case of that little request response protocol the second is figuring out what is your common ancestor. Okay, so you've got two different blockchains on two different peers. And you need to figure out, okay, so presumably at some point they agreed. Again, worst case scenario, it's they agree on the first block of the blockchain, maybe not the second. Worst case scenario, it's the first block. But hopefully they agree on something further down. 
and they need to find where that last agreement point is before they start to disagree on what the blockchain is. So you can do a sort of a binary search of your respective chains by looking for particular block IDs at particular heights, seeing where your two chains line up, and then where the two chains do not line up. And you, know, you stitch those results together and you figure out your common ancestor. You got your common ancestor. Well, now you can go figure out what blocks you need to go and get from the peer from there. Uh, so again, it's a utility protocol, but it comes in real handy uh, for a couple different purposes. Okay, so those top five there are request response protocols. It's basically a client is asking a server for information. And again, there, there's there's you know two of those within each multiplex or like within each multiplexer. So one acts as the server, one acts as the client. The last two listed on here are block adoption notification protocol and transaction notification protocol. So these are notification protocols. And they're primarily used for gossiping information, basically like sending up you know flags saying, "Hey, I know about this block. I adopted it. Like I, I I'm asserting that this block not only exists, but it's also valid. And I'm telling you about it, but just telling you about the block ID of it. Okay, so that's what that 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 one's responsible for is just notifying whenever you adopt a new valid block to your chain. You're telling other peers about that block ID. And then this the final one, the transaction notification protocol, is responsible for sharing transactions with the rest of the network. So most of the time, uh, transaction like people in the blockchain space they they think of transactions sitting in the mempool. Well, I, I don't know where I was going with that. The, the mempool holds on to transactions that are not yet on the blockchain and new transactions that users create go into the mempool first before they can be included in the blockchain. So anytime a user uh, like broadcasts a, a notification to a node, that node needs to go and notify other peers about that notification ID. And similarly, once I've heard notification about a, a, a transaction ID from a remote peer. Well, I first need to go and get that transaction and then do a couple validation checks, but then I can go and tell other nodes. I can notify other nodes about that transaction's existence. Again, I'm just telling them about a transaction ID. Okay, so these last two things, they are really just responsible for telling people that data exists. All the other protocols are responsible for fetching that data. Okay, so in this model, the server only has real power in those notification protocols. Everything else is the client requesting data from that server. So the client has a lot of the power in this particular you know, model. Uh, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit in a moment once I get over to the uh, like web browser stuff, but I just wanted to pause again, see if we might have any other questions while I take a sip of water and put on some more awesome music. Yeah, ready. We got a good question here. Let me uh, throw this one up. Will more network messages be added in the future? Uh, probably, but the hope is that this covers a lot of ground. Um, in that, like, we we don't really need to. With that said, there's no reason that we can't. You know, it takes I don't know, not that many lines of code to go and 
add a new type protocol to our system. Um, it's really just about like defining your type protocol, your type protocol message type, um, or message types, I should say, uh, your state types, um, and then, yeah, handler logic, I guess, on like how, how you interpret um, that particular type protocol. So, yeah, again, uh, we, we totally could add more network messages, uh, but we're hoping that this this set right here is going to cover a lot of our ground. You know, just kind of riff on that a little bit. So that block adoption notification protocol, it may seem like it's not very much where it's just kind of announcing block IDs to the world, but that is pretty much the entire blockchain right there in that one protocol. Like assuming the data is available somewhere, like by data, I mean the actual block data, then just notifying that a block has been appended to the chain is a ton of information to be giving to the world. Because encoded in that block adoption notification is an assertion that the block header is the best header right now. It produces the best chain as far as the chain selection algorithm goes. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, that block header is valid. So like all the contents of it are valid and it satisfies all of the requirements for our proof of state consensus mechanism, Tacticos. Uh, again, if you want to learn more about Tacticos, uh, check out some some videos from Aaron or, you know, just check us out on Discord. Hans and Aaron, they'd be happy to you know, answer your questions about consensus. Um, anyway, so the block header is valid. Uh, next up, we have the block body is valid. And embedded with that assertion that the block body is valid is that all of the transactions within that block body are also valid. Which means all of the proofs in that trans all of the proofs in all of the transactions satisfy all the propositions in all the transactions. Uh, all the UTXOs are properly spent, all of the funds line up, um, and like everything holds together. So in that one simple little 32 or 33 byte message, that notification is a whole lot of utility, like a whole lot of information you can derive from it. And then again, the rest of these are just helping you gather data about that announcement. Um, so yeah, a lot of the blockchain is encoded in that one protocol. So again, hopefully we won't need to add too many more in the future. Alrighty. So let's turn that off. Okay, let's uh, let's check out some of the inspiration here. I mentioned Cardano. We love Cardano. We love IOHK. They do really awesome things, and they're really really smart people. So thank you, Cardano, for existing and pushing technology and pushing proof of stake consensus to the next level. Uh. Again, sharing is mutually beneficial. If you're interested in our tech, check it out. Uh, hopefully we can collaborate, mix ideas together, come up with something awesome. Um, but so yeah, uh, just wanted to mention that. Anyway, uh, we we are you know pretty heavily inspired by uh, a lot of the work that Cardano does. So I just wanted to you know, bring up some of the, the documentation that they have about the Cardano network. Uh, so you can find this here, docs.cardano.org, and then uh, click or select Explore Cardano, and then Cardano Network. And this gives you some information about you know, Cardano's network, obviously. Uh, what I was most interested in here is the... Uh, okay, so yeah, this is uh, like some of their type protocols. You can see a bunch of these little, like the, the, the light blue circles are, are type protocols, essentially. Uh, don't worry about the dark blue circles. That's like threading and whatnot. Um, the protocols, there are a bunch of them. They all get multiplexed. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's like a similar model to what I just outlined. Uh, what I was really looking for was this utilizing mini protocols. So mini protocols are used to communicate between multiple nodes while implementing exchange requirements. Okay, so mini protocol. Modular building block. 
I don't know if that sounds familiar. Bricks, blocks, whatever, same thing. I like bricks so that you don't confuse it with blocks in the blockchain. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, bringing this up because this, this is kind of, again, what inspired what we do. You can see, again, request response protocol. It's request response protocol is polymorphic in the request and response data. I don't know why I'm actually reading this. I think that they talk about in this doc here that I'll talk about in a second that they don't really use this. It's more just a reference thing, the request response protocol. Uh, the main potatoes of Cardano's uh, networking type protocols are, it's basically in these two things, primarily in this chain synchronization protocol one though. Um, this is a, it's a, it's a very complex, um, very detailed typed protocol. There is a lot that goes into this one particular chain synchronization protocol. So it's, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but it's, it's, it is very complex. This is just what I wanted to mention there. Then they got some other ones. I don't know why I'm scrolling through here. Might as well just look at it here in this doc. So again, the Shelly networking protocol. So Shelly, uh, we've got Monon, Dion, and Tetra. They've got Byron and Shelly and others. I'm sorry, uh, Cardano team. I, I don't remember the rest of them, but you know, different, different, like you know, major releases of their protocol. Uh, okay, so in this doc, they've yeah, a bunch of words. I'm I'm more of a pictures person, so let's just let's just get to the pictures. Uh, I'm gonna skip the handshake one. I'm gonna skip a couple of these. Actually, uh, I probably shouldn't have skipped the handshake. Now let's just dive in. This will be fun. So this is the big old beast that I was talking about. This is the chain sync protocol. So this one that I just said was like really complex. Well, this is the the interaction pattern, um, and this drives basically the consensus mechanism for like you know Cardano. Um, it's telling, it's it's helping two peers synchronize their chains, and it does so by having a peer tell the other, "Hey, roll forward to this block," and then "Hey, roll forward to this block," and then "Roll forward to this block." Then, oh wait, I got a I got a new block. We're gonna we're gonna roll back, and then we're gonna roll back again, and then we're gonna roll forward and roll forward. So it's like the, the server is very much telling the client, here's what you're going to do. Um, and so I, I'm only mentioning that just to, to, to highlight a bit of a difference here. I mentioned that in, in our approach, the client has a lot more power, uh, whereas in, in this approach here, the server has a lot more power. Um, anyway, so yeah, like you, you can go and you know, scroll through rest of Cardano's interesting uh, uh, type protocols that they, they have here um, around like transactions. They have like a different set of type protocols that are specifically meant for communicating with a local uh, client, like for wallet type stuff primarily uh, and less about node to node communication. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's a, uh, it's like their network spec. We, we very heavily read this and referenced it as we were, uh, trying to design our protocol. Uh, okay, I just wanted to open up. Uh, you can find some more information about the Ouroboros network documentation here. Uh, they got some other links. So again, this is uh, github.com slash input dash output dash HK slash Ouroboros dash network. Uh, there we go. That link, <laughs> um, and so yeah, this this just has well, it links to some of the things that I just showed, uh, namely Shelly networking protocol is the PDF that we were just looking at, and then the official Cardano documentation is this thing. And then there's some other information if you're curious. Um, okay, uh, this oh yeah, I just wanted to pull up. So this is like their, uh, I think it's called Haddock. What do they call it? I don't, uh, yeah, Haddock. This is like the the documentation stuff for Haskell code, like Haskell libraries. And so this is the protocol specification for the chain sync. Um, 
And yeah, there's this is just like a reference. It's not the actual implementation code, but you know, you can kind of see some stuff there. And then this is the actual implementation code. There we go. So yeah, like on the, the Haskell side for Cardano implementing the chain sync protocol. This is like the client side of it. There's also server. Um, so yeah, you can you can find their code up on GitHub. Uh, reason that I'm mentioning it again is just because this is written in Haskell, whereas uh, Tetra, like our code base is written in Scala, but Tetra is written using the cats library, which essentially, essentially tries to replicate Haskell in the Scala language. Um, so it kind of holds together really nicely. Because we didn't do chain sync. We did different protocols. Um, anyway, okay. I only got a few minutes. I thought there would be more time. Turns out I ramble a lot. Who to thunk? This is our code. We're looking at Scala. Uh, let's hop into like multiplexer, for example. This seems like it was going to be a complicated beast, but at least in the simple approach, I was really just able to tap into some ACA streaming, uh, like graph DSL type stuff in order to implement it in not very many lines of code. Okay, so again, this is like our whole implementation for the multiplexer process of like taking a bunch of different type protocols and running them over a single communication protocol and then unstitching them again to demultiplex. Well, all of that takes place here in about 58 lines. Uh, probably about 15, which are documentation. So it wasn't all that complicated to implement. Uh, I guess there are, there's like a couple other things in here. Uh, this is the real meat and potatoes of the multiplexer. The real complicated thing to implement, actually, again, it wasn't all, actually all that complicated to implement, but more interesting was the type protocol side of things. Um, so we could just have like a, a little description of what a type protocol is, and then a link to the thing that we were just looking at, in the, the Cardano docs, just like as a reference, if, if folks are curious when they stumble upon it. Um, but we were able to boil all of our typed protocols down to <laughs> four states. Again, all of the type protocols down to four states. And then what is that? Five different message types. Three of them are polymorphic, I guess. So it's it's a little bit more than five if, if you want to be annoying about it. Um Anyway, these are just like like the the common states and common messages that we were able to use in our blockchain protocols. That let me show this real quick: slot data request response protocol, and then header body transaction. Blah 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 blah. Well, okay, ignore keep alive, but we have a slot data request response protocol that accepts uh, well block ID is the request and then it responds with slot data optionally but this is the type that it responds with and then we got another one for block headers and then another one for block bodies and then transactions and then block id at height which is a little bit more complicated but it still roughly fits within the same pattern uh, don't worry about the second thing there uh, for now it's just this is the height that you're interested in and then this is the id that you hope to hear back about. Okay, so those are like the, you know, all those request response protocols. So those first five on, on this on this slide here. And then finally at the bottom, we've got these two. So block adoptions. So notifying of uh, whenever you adopt a block on your chain. And then finally, transaction broadcasts. So anytime you include a new transaction in your mempool, you tell other nodes about it. Now that's just like definition stuff, but because we were able to boil it down to just like these simple types with just two families or two like, I guess, classes of type protocol, it's like the machinery for it. We only had to really write it, you know, once for each family and then reuse it across these different protocols. Um, all that implementation logic is, you know, split between these different packages here. Oh, sorry, I should mention we have a type protocols package and that's 
not specific to blockchains at all. It's just like a general library for type protocols. I've got a peer-to-peer -peer package. Again, not specific to blockchain. Uh, it's just a, a, a library for, I guess, running a peer-to-peer -peer network over uh, ACA. Uh, ACA streaming TCP, I should say. I've got another package here for multiplexing. Again, not specific to blockchains, but it is like leveraging type protocols through these subhandlers. But then finally, we apply those three things into a particular domain, into our blockchain domain with this package. So we just you know, give implementations for those things here in this blockchain package. And so those, all those things combined get you uh, our networking SBT module here in our Bifrost repo in the Tetra branch. Uh, so again, there's a there's a lot more detail uh, about the implementation, of course, but just wanted to give an overview of, I guess, how we approach networking and how we did it, um, and you know, some of the the challenges that we ran into along the way. So that's all I got for today. So uh, let's pass it back to y'all. See if see if you got some. Some questions for me. You can ask me about the code. You can ask me about uh, Cardano networking stuff that I mentioned. You can ask me about anything in the slides. You can ask me about life in general. You can ask me about amateur welding. You can ask me about construction with PVC sheets. I've been getting into that a little bit more lately. It's a lot of fun. It's really interesting construction material. Unfortunately, it's really bad for the environment. So sometimes I feel guilty. Oh. Oh man, I thought there was a question. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'll just throw this up anyway. A little party. So yeah, peer-to-peer -peer networking in Tetra. Hope uh, hope you maybe learned something. I had fun talking. I always do. You're always a tremendous audience. Okay, well, I think uh, I think we can probably you know just wrap it up here. Again, if you ever have questions or comments, uh, oh, we got a got a question here. Have you benchmarked the type protocols at all? Uh, actually, no, not not really. Um, oh heck, there's there's oh man, there's like a whole other topic that. I completely forgot to, to mention, which was like the, the simulated geospatial delay flow, which allows us to simulate network delay on our blockchain using ACA streams. Um, and that's not getting into benchmarking. Uh, I guess the point of me bringing this up is like, we're, we're assuming that the network's going to be the slow part and not, not, not the implementation, so to speak. Real bold assumption, right? I'm a I'm a perfect developer. I would never write something suboptimal, right? Let's just uh, let's just close all these tabs. Don't look at my code. Just don't look at it. Uh, so yeah, we probably do need to benchmark them um, at some point, just to just to see how they perform, and especially over a multiplexer. Uh, yeah, good question. Okie dokie. Well, it is Thursday evening and I am hungry, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Appreciate you all joining us here today. Uh, let me find this this thing here that, that that tells you where to go. It's got one of those cool little QR codes that you can scan with your, your fancy phone user. And it, it takes you to this link tree link so link tree slash topple underscore protocol and from that link tree you can find our discord you can find our twitter our linkedin our twitch our github our youtube uh, our other website you can also find some hiring information if you're curious if you want to join us and help us build a really awesome blockchain protocol um yeah i mean that that's uh that's all i got for you today hope you all enjoyed uh feel free to hit us up on discord uh, if you have any questions comments feedback criticisms 
happy to hear it. Okie dokie. Have a good one, folks. Happy Thursday.